NVIDIA's 5070 here. So let's do a launch review and see if this card is even worth the trouble to get. Welcome to Machines More. The 50 series card launches continue. Today we have NVIDIA's mid-range offering, which is the 5070. And this card sits beneath the 5090, 5080, and 5070 Ti, and there's nothing beneath it yet, but if the pass is any indication, there will be additional cards slotted below, such as a 5060, 5060 Ti, and so on and so forth. So reference price is set at 549, and unlike 5070 Ti, NVIDIA is doing a Founders Edition card for this one. So in that sense, the reference pricing is a little bit more meaningful since NVIDIA will be committing to sell a card at that price. Now this ASUS Prime Series 5070 here, which is a base level AIB card, should also be offered at MSRP, although at what quantity the MSRP partner cards are sold at, that remains an unknown at this point, and I'm not privy to that info. Before we dive into the review, I did want to let you know that ASUS supplied the reviewer's unit here today. Uh, big thanks to them for supporting this review and the channel. But uh, as with all my reviews here, they are not sponsored by the company and the testing conduct here is independent. If you enjoy content like this, please go ahead and hit that subscribe button. It really helps and big thanks. So quick facts on the 5070. This is NVIDIA's mid-range Blackwell GPU and it's based on the 4N process. It is equipped with 32% fewer CUDA cores versus the 5070 Ti. And at least based on NVIDIA's own specs, the 5070 Ti delivers 30% less AI trillions of operations per second and roughly 30% less RT flops compared to that model. So it's kind of a baseline expectation is that the 5070 could have that much of a deficit compared to the 70 Ti, and we'll get into the actual testing results here shortly. This is further compounded by the 12 gigabytes of GDDR7 VRAM that it has, and it runs on a 192-bit bus, which uh, works out to 672 gigabytes per second of bandwidth versus the 16 gigabytes of VRAM that the 70 Ti has. Now I can't disclose how the Radeon 9070 performs quite yet and you'll have to come back tomorrow for that, but since the Radeon specs are public, public at this point, uh, we know on capacity alone this is an easy win for the 9070 over the 5070. Even though there we have an older GDDR6 setup, uh, 4 gigs is 4 gigs and I do wish Nvidia would have specced 16 gigs here. Since 12 is exactly the same as a 4070, and there was even a 4060 Ti SKU where you could have gotten 16 gigs, right? Another step down here is the NVENC setup, where although the decoder is the same, it has one fewer encoder. And the 5070 is spec'd at a 250 watt total bore power figure, which is actually quite high for a 70 level card. Uh, we saw that number go up for the 3070, and it came back down for the 4070, and now it has gone up quite a bit again. And unlike the 5070 Ti where the power draw was much lower than the total board power, in my testing, the 5070 got pretty close. It was running somewhere around 20, 240 watts uh, regularly for uh, 1440p gaming. Headline MSRP is $200 lower than the 5070 Ti, and that is also $50 lower than the 4070 initially launched at, which was uh, around about 600 US. The 5070 is spec'd with a base clock of 2.33 gigahertz and a boost clock of 2.51 gigahertz. Prime card here, which is a non-factory OC model, uh, boosted higher than that, and it's settled in at around 2800 megahertz. Uh, so as an example, in gaming, it drew down around 240 watts with a total system draw for my 9800X3 system of 400 watts. Let's get into the benchmarks. Uh, now I do wanna note that the 5070 Ti, I make some comparisons to is the tough OC that I reviewed last week. Given that, that there is a factory OC model, you're gonna see a little bit bigger difference versus the base 5070 that we're looking at today. So the tough OC is a few percentage points better than a basic 5070 Ti, so uh, keep that in mind. Also noting that there is no Founders Edition with the 70 Ti, unlike with the 5070. So 5070 is going to be a gamer's GPU and the RAS rise performance will be the focus of our benchmarks today. NVIDIA has been pushing their multi-frame gen pretty hard and while that's neat, it doesn't have as much 
applicability to a wider range of gaming uses, uh, in my opinion. So I'll show you some synthetic benchmarks and then we'll get into a selection of titles. Uh, depending on the title, you'll see the card perform better in some, worse than some, but the intent here is to give you a holistic idea of where this card's performance is. And then, you know, you can evaluate whether or not it's worth uh, targeting tomorrow. First off with Unigen Superposition at 4K optimized, the 5070 here is about 24 to 25% behind the 5070 Ti and roughly 28% over the 4070. In 3D Mark, Time Spy Extreme, similar placement versus those two cards. And then finally, 3D Mark Port Royal, where there's also a similar gaps here. So based on the synthetics with the 5070, we might expect to be around 25% behind a 5070 Ti, but there looks to be a bigger gain versus the standard 4070. For gaming, benchmarks here are at 1440p and for the most part, highest settings available, which provides a nice balance. You might be looking at a 5070 for moderate frame rate 4K or high frame rate 1440p. At these settings, uh, we're not CPU limited, and we can get a solid idea of how powerful this card is. So starting with Cyberpunk 2077, for just rasterization, no ray tracing or DLSS, the 5070 performs similarly to the A4070 Ti Super OC, which isn't bad. Some of you might remember that was supposed to be called A4080 with 12 gigs of VRAM, and here we are about... 37% ahead of the vanilla 4070. So this is the title with the biggest gap I ended up seeing for 5070 versus 4070. So it doesn't really get any better than this. And just to call it out, 4070 over 3070 was about 30% for reference. Enabling ray tracing does drop the performance down significantly, even with the 5070 Ti for this to be enjoyable with RT on, you may consider enabling DLSS, which uh, with nvidia's multi-friend gen which you know call it what you will it can be useful but i wouldn't use this as my top criteria for choosing a gpu in 2025. next up is red dead 2 great cinematic title here that is usually fairly demanding here it is about 18 percent worse than the 70 ti oc and about 18 percent better than the 4070 and i will note here 4070 versus 3070 is also about a 30 percent uplift MSFS 2020, the 5070 performed worse than a 4070 Super. It's about 21% behind a 5070 Ti here, so a small 15%-ish bump over the 4070. Black Myth Wukong, extremely demanding title. First off, uh, tested at very high settings without any ray tracing enable, just a little bit a tiny bit better than a 4070 Super. The math works out to be 24% better than a 4070. With ray tracing enabled, performance declines to a crawl, similar placement still though. With frame gen on, this does bump up a little bit, but overall, this is a very tough test with ray tracing on. Shadow of the Tomb Raider, older title, but useful to see where the hierarchy is. 19% behind 5070 Ti and 27% over the 4070. Assassin's Creed Mirage, here the 5070 Ti performs about 17% better than the 5070. And in Assassin's Creed Valhalla, the 5070 comes in at 20% over the 4070. Finally, Age of Empires 4. The 5070 didn't do particularly well here, and it came in 24% worse than the 70 Ti and below a 4070 Super. So it's only about 15% over a 4070. As a whole, looking at the rasterization benchmarks, the 5070 is coming in roughly 20% over the 4070. So there were some high points, there were some low points. Um, but this overall is kind of in the ballpark of 50 series gains that we've seen so far uh, over the 40 series. But the one really disappointing statistic is that it barely beats out a 4070 Super. And granted, that 40 Super benchmark I have here is a slightly OC'd model, but still that's not particularly impressive. And we, if we look at productivity purposes and Blender benchmark, it's actually just a slight bit worse than the 4070 Super as well. So I'm pretty confident that this is where this card stacks up. Being a base spec model, there is a good amount of room for users to play with. Now, I didn't have too much time to turn this one around, so I didn't spend as much time here uh, as I would have liked. But by increasing the power limit by 20%, 
For Cyberpunk, the total board power settled in at 260 watts. That's a 417 watts of total system power, and that was clocked to 30, 37 megahertz. So there's a modest bump up here in the synthetic, 7 to 8%, and that translates to about 5% on the averages for Assassin's Creed Mirage and about 4% for cyberpunk so it's actually a very modest bump considering the power increase there so the prime cooler is still more than capable for handling this the temps did get a little bit higher as expected but it's not unreasonable given the manual oc and did keep the fan speeds the same just to get the change in thermals for your reference so i did want to talk briefly about asus's implementation here this is their model that should be available at MSRP, and the temps overall with this cooler, as you just saw, uh, for 50, 70 are quite good. So for the 70 Ti, I did look at the Tough series, which is a much bigger cooler. These Prime coolers are a bit more no-nonsense, and I actually prefer these because they are quite compact, and if you're familiar with the ProArt line, the current gen of coolers from the Prime series takes cues from that shroud design, such as the, the rounded corners here. So I kind of consider this more of a uh, Prime Art card, if you will. So the AIB cooler for this one is listed under NVIDIA's small form factor ready enthusiast card list, which just means that the overall dimensions of the card fit within a set of dimensions that are published by NVIDIA and are therefore compatible with a short list of SFF cases that are guaranteed to support at least that much cooler. So that doesn't mean that this is a compact card though, it's actually still quite long at uh, 304 millimeters long and uh, two and a half slots thick, right? 15 millimeters thick, which no coincidence that this is the longest and thickest dimension allowed under those guidelines, but it can fit some small cases such as the Terra without any particular difficulty. So just make sure you're aware of the potential riser kibble concerns at this point with a cutover to PCIe Gen 5 if you're deploying on a sandwich style case. The card is 126 millimeter wide and with the 16 pin connector that's slightly recessed, a typical 16 pin connector will still protrude beyond the width of the cooler, so just be aware of that. And one feature I do like that you don't always see at this more base level partner implementation is a warning LED. And if you've got your 16 cable, 16 pin cable not making proper contact, then it'll light up red and you should check it. Just make sure it seats all the way because that could be bad for that connector. This particular cooler vents out the side, so it'll operate in a more conventional way versus Nvidia's Founder Edition which for this generation is designed to exhaust out the back plate and uh, some vents near the power port. And for a lot of sandwich style cases where spacing around the back plate is fixed and tight, this type of conventional design can be very helpful. So here you can see I've taken off the shroud without having to separate the heatsink from the GPU die. And that is a feature that is useful for cleaning and you know, just, I guess you're showing you the heatsink which has a total of four heat pipes. Four of those extend through the flow through section past the PCB. And you have three heat pipes that are extending towards the IO end and kind of loop back around. Underneath the heat sink, ASUS uses a phase change thermal pad for die contact. So no paste, better longevity here and more consistency. On the shroud, three axial fans with dual ball bearings. The middle one does spin in an opposing direction versus the other two. And this is a dual VBIOS card. If you toggle between the P and Q mode, you're essentially controlling the fan speeds. Uh, the Q mode will run the fans approximately 300 RPM lower under most fully loaded uh, gaming scenarios. And the trade-off there is, uh, in my testing, about eight degrees of higher temps. Now, that only ended up sacrificing about 20 megahertz in clock so it's really nothing to be concerned about if you're chasing lower noise that can be an easy way to accomplish that metal back plate here and underneath there are in fact thermal pads so in addition to providing protection and added stiffness to the pcb it does also have the ability to draw some heat away from the pcb as well so in terms of this particular partner model i like asus's prime here this is a solid implementation and these coolers are absolutely up to the task for the 5070 and with the sensible 5070 board power here we are looking at fan noise that is going to be very much tolerable and here's just a quick sound sample 
uh, to a few levels surrounding the levels that I typically observe during gaming. This is the system with the fans off. This is the fans at 1,100 RPM. It's roughly where the uh, fans spun at in the Q mode. This level translates to roughly 1,420 RPM, which is right around where the fans spun at in the P mode for gaming. And here we are at 1,770 RPM. So if you have a warmer room, 2,100 RPM, it's unlikely that the card fans will need to spin this fast. Just to give you an idea, this is 70% on the fan speed, so they can go faster still. So despite being the base model, the Prime is well built and uh, the cooler is, I think, quite elegant looking and you're not really paying for extra bells or whistles on the cooler and the muted aesthetic. I think it really makes it easy for a wide variety of builds. So let's go ahead and sum up the 5070 in general. So this is not a terrible gen over gen improvement. Similar manufacturing processes as the 40 series and the 20% or so uplift is on par with what we've been seeing with 50 series over 40 series lately. Is the 5070 great? No, I don't think so, not at all. As far as I can tell, it's only slightly better than a 4070 Super. Uh, you probably couldn't even call this a 4070 Super Super. And outside of NVIDIA's cherry pick DLSS and MFG titles, this is no 4090, right? But a big part of this decision will come down to price. So not so long ago, you could get a 4070 Super for $600 US. And of course that market's all blown up right now. So uh, GPU pricing is completely messed up with the 50 series launch, but perhaps just imagine you got in a time machine and you went back to January and someone handed you a $50 coupon for a 4070 Super. whoop de doo right? Still, if you are on a 30 series card or older and you are looking for a so-called mid-range card, can you get a 4070 Super reasonably right now? No, uh, assuming you can get the 5070 such as this prime model at MSRP, so 550 US. Uh, if you really need a card now, it's okay. Uh, the performance, while not nearly as good of, a, as a, of an uplift over the previous gen, and especially considering the added power, it's still a reasonable upgrade if you're on those older gen cards. So 5070 is supposed to be available at 9 a.m. Eastern on March 5th. The pattern with the last few 50 series launches, the inventory has been extremely limited. Availability of Founders Edition cards and AIC cards around MSRP have been difficult to get and there have been a lot of partner models with a heftier price tag. So if you find yourself striking out with the card that you want, I would hesitate to recommend that you move too much beyond the MSRP cards because the difference with this one is that you do have an alternative other than just you know, throwing your hands up in the air because unlike with the past 50 series launches, there is a competing product from AMD, right? So not co coincidentally, their review embargo for the 9070 XT and 9070 reviews lift at the same time. So perhaps a game plan could be, uh, you know, go and see if you can snag an MSRP 5070 while also keeping an eye out for 9070 reviews. The 9070 has a suggested pricing of 549 from AMD, so kind of same as this one. So as long as it is as good or better, then it's definitely something you can reorient towards and definitely hope that you'll come back and check out my 9070 reviews tomorrow. So uh, please give a like. Um, I'll leave the links uh, for the cards and the system down below. Big thanks for watching.